Can everyone take their seats if there are enough? We're going to get started. Hi. <laughs> um, my name is Brett Solomon. I'm the executive director of Access, accessnow.org. Thank you. <laughs> Um, nothing could make me happier than seeing this um, <clears throat> concentrated group of experts in this room. Um, we don't necessarily think alike or necessarily speak the same languages or necessarily agree on everything, but one thing I do know for sure is that this group of people is probably the highest concentration of people who are committed to an open internet and the defense of digital rights of its users that are anywhere in Silicon Valley, anywhere in America, maybe anywhere in the world. So, Thank you very much for coming. Um, we're actually 350 organizations and companies here, nine governments, um, including the European Parliament, dozens of activists from all over the world, including many people who actually left serious danger in order to get here and put themselves in danger to get here. Um, this conference um, um, brings together people f actually from over 60 countries. And I think there's a map which is um, up there. Like this is the geographical territory that we cover. And in fact, we've got a map outside which is th the same as this, but it has red dots. So you can add your red dots specifically from where you're from. So Access uh, at, at its heart is a human rights organization. We, we live at the intersection of human rights and new technology. And our mission is to defend and extend the digital rights of users um, at risk. We have a three-part strategy. We, use, we develop um, principled and pragmatic policy. We use our advocacy now to get those policies considered and adopted. And we have a technology arm that works with activists and actors and civil society all around the world who are facing digital insecurity. Our tech director, Gustav Bjorkston, who is here somewhere, unless he's writing some code, um, and moved to Tunis with his family. And in fact, the whole Tunis uh, Access office is here. Um, and downstairs, starting tomorrow, is the Digital Security Health Clinic. So if anybody is interested in bringing their hardware uh, or talking to any experts about any digital security issues that they might face or that their communities might face, the, the clinic is set up for the next two days. So. Um, you can see this conference is a little bit different than other conferences. There's bean bags, there's plants, there's couches. Um, this room is actually normally full of um, seats, bleachers, and we got them taken out. I asked if we could move the stage into the middle, but Ryan and, um, and Eric, who have worked so diligently to put this conference on, looked at me and they were like, no. <laughs> um, but let's have a round of applause for Eric and, and, and Ryan. For So I know a lot of people here know a lot of people here, um, but what I want you to do, because this conference, as I say, is different to others, it's not necessarily about a person up on stage or an expert talking at you, because in fact, this whole room is full of experts. So what I'm going to ask you to do for just a minute or two is talk to the person next to you who you don't know. Who you don't know. For a minute. Why are you here? What are you doing here? And most importantly, Start talking. <laughs> Thank you. I knew that that would happen. Everybody warned me. So don't do that. You won't be able to stop them talking. Um, I hope you talked about the most important thing, which is what the internet runs on, whether it's kittens or puppies. Um, and in fact, we have a, um, a thing, uh, a service here, Slido, which is sli.do forward slash rightscon. So if any of your, in any of your sessions, if you want to take the temperature of the room, you can put up a question and people can vote on it. And then you can see, even at the beginning of a session or at the end of a session, if the positions have changed from people uh, after the discussion. So, um, so we have a lot of serious work to do at this conference. Um, there are some serious questions that we need to ask of each other and of ourselves. Um, and of the governments and the corporations who are here. Um, and, and I actually wanted to say that there's a number of companies and a number of governments that we ask to be here who aren't. Um, so um, special thanks to the numerous technology companies and numerous governments 
who are in the room. And I think we should treat each other with respect, with honesty, and in the spirit of moving forward. So indeed, I think the purpose of this conference really is to, to, to build coalitions, to build action plans, and even just to create the next step. So what I'd like to do for the next little period uh, is to talk about like, what's actually going to happen at this conference. Like, what are the issues that are on the table? Um, and who's in the room? As I said, there's a serious number of experts. Um, and many of us are asking whether surveillance is, um, 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 many of us are actually asking if, if democracy is dead in the age of surveillance. You know, there are databases that are full of our political views, our medical records, uh, our, our most intimate relationships. And as I think even someone here revealed, um, the NSA in one month last year collected more than three billion pieces of intelligence material in just one month. So Penn will talk to us about the consequence of that surveillance on authors, and there are a number of authors here. Benetech will talk about the impact of that surveillance on journalists, access about the impact on human rights defenders, and APC and others about the impact on LGBT campaigners. All these organizations are here. To my mind, privacy is not a luxury, but it's the foundation of a, of a free and open society. There are representatives of the US government here, and, I, and many others, and I think they will be asked the hard questions by you, um, and hopefully there will be some answers. Joe McNamee from European Digital Rights and the shining light of the European Parliament with respect to rights, Marecha Schack, uh, is here. The Under Secretary Laname from Estonia, who looks after transatlantic affairs and is hosting the next event in Tallinn in Estonia, is also here. Welcome to each of you. And this conference is part of a series of conferences. We're organizing this one, but there's the San Paolo event in April, um, there's the Tallinn event, and then there's the SIP event. Johan Hallenburg is also here from CETA, as is Lucy Andrade. So many of us think that the, there is a trade-off, there is a false trade-off between privacy and security. To my mind, privacy actually leads to a stable society and to an open and connected community. Um, so, and, and security comes from transparency. It comes from accountability. It doesn't come from unlawful law enforcement and doesn't come from warrantless spying on people. But we want to test that assumption as well. And many of the governments and, and companies and others should ask myself and others the hard questions as well. How will we deal with terrorism and nef nefarious actions online? How, will, how do we bring and propose to bring the rule of law into the digital environment? Turkey's social media advisor Ali Sahin said that a tweet is more dangerous or can be more dangerous than a car bomb. I think my phone's ringing. Um, <laughs> um, we have activists here from Istanbul who will refute that. And the, and the drafters of the necessary and proportionate principles, Access, EFF, and Privacy International are also in the room. Uh, more than 400 organizations internationally have signed those principles. Can I just get a show of hands? Like, who, which organizations here have signed the necessary and proportionate principles? OK, so we have a lot to go, <laughs> including the governments. The governments are being asked to sign up to Necessary and Proportionate. And we will ask you at the end of the conference whether that is, that is likely to be the case. So the tools for surveillance have never been more powerful. The storage has never been cheaper, the rules more lax, or the database is so large. We have Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Skype, Yahoo, Dropbox. Chevron, as I now found out after my speaking to somebody I didn't know, uh, in the room. We should also ask them the hard questions. But think about the coalitions that we can build, like Stop, Stop Government Surveillance Initiative and the Need to Know Coalition, which have worked across sectors to try and create change. And of course, the campaign that Access will be launching tomorrow, Encrypt All the Things. And meanwhile, and thanks to Amy, who's somewhere uh, right there, um, and meanwhile, four prosecutors from the International Criminal Court have flown here from The Hague to learn more about cyber forensics and, and how, to prosecute by, um, how to prosecute those who commit crimes against humanity. Over the next few days, they will meet 
with technologists and companies to work out how to hone their skills, how to collect evidence without putting people at risk, and how to document human rights abuses. So as we progress over the next few days, some think that I'm sure that we should fire the lawyers and hire the engineers. Find out on Wednesday where you sit in that debate. And what do you think about net network neutrality? How are we going to ensure that the free flow of information um, moves without discrimination? Reagan McDonald from my team and Luca Belli from the Dynamic Coalition on Net Neutrality are here and we'll be talking with others including Luca Belli and Joanna Varon who are trying to push the Marco Seville through in, in Brazil to enshrine net neutrality in their country. You can meet six representatives of six of the world's largest telcos. British Telecom, um, Orange, France Telecom, AT&T, Verizon, they're all here. Between them, they serve more than a billion customers. A change of policy at that level can change the privacy or the freedom of expression rights of a billion people. And some of you are working at the international level. Some of you have just come back from Geneva talking about the latest UN resolution on the right to privacy in the digital age. Congratulations to APC, Human Rights Watch, um, um, Amnesty International, again, who are all in the room, who worked to support the resolution, which saw the first major statement on privacy from the United Nations in 25 years, and confirmed to us that no one will be shall be subject to arbitrary interference of their privacy in the digital environment. And that was the breakthrough. If you're interested in development, Oxfam and other partners are here to look at how the right to information and free media um, can be integrated into the post-2015 development goals. I want to welcome in particular the philanthropic community, For, um, Ford, <coughs> Oak, MDF, CEDA, all of them are in the room and they will be meeting, there's many meetings focused on philanthropy, human rights and new technology and to try to create the resource base that enables much of this to happen. I think it's time that we even think about putting the establishment of a $50 million digital rights fund firmly on this conference agenda. Go on. <laughs> and above or below all of this is the internet governance framework. And there are people from across the world who are here, Brazil, um, FGV and ITS, Global Partners Digital, um, the Internet Democracy Project, the Internet Jurisdiction Project, who are working with governments from the UK to Estonia to work out how we're going to update and reform internet governance so it better reflects the human rights framework and ensures that this thing that we love, the internet, is protected and governed in a multi-stakeholder and decentralized fashion. And many of the organizations who are doing the online campaigning are here also. Get up, move on, of us, some of us, fight for the future, free press and more. Welcome. These might be the organizations that save us. They will discuss what is the future of online campaigning in a censored, surveilled, and photographed, by the looks of it, um, environment. Indeed, what is the future of, of civil society? And how do we protect the building blocks of a distributed and decentralized internet? Gustav, again, will talk about the, the, in his session about global uh, civil society under attack. But my favorite over the next few days is sure to be the demo room, which is hard to get to. You've got to go outside and back in, which is where all the techies are who have been there all day already for hours doing tech demos and presentations and lightning talks. Um, welcome to each of you. Please don't silo yourselves just off into the tech room and all of the policy people should make their way down there as well. You'll hear from everyone, including the extraordinary Citizen Lab, Commotion, Witness, CryptoCat, Tor, as Ryan would say, oh my god. <laughs> so you name it, it's covered. And I think we want to test the three assumptions that, that Nathan from Guardian posted on the Liberation Tech list just now, that Tor is slow, PGP is hard, and no one cares about privacy. <laughs> Let's challenge and test that. Um, let's talk about anonymity with Colin Crowell from, from Twitter and others 
enjoy snapshots from Iran, Azerbaijan, Sudan, China, Turkey, Vietnam. I want to make special mention of the International Campaign for Human Rights in Iran, who will talk about satellite jamming in the after this afternoon in the demo room. And finally, and I'll finish here before I bring on the, the superstars behind me, um, there, there are a number of off-the-record meetings that will take place between governments and activists, companies and governments, companies and activists, and between representatives of the former Soviet Union, including Estonia, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, all are in the room. Um, and I'd like to make special note of Oksana um, Romanovic, who um, perhaps caught the last plane out of Kiev. Um, there she is, she's waving over there. <laughs> Oksana and I have been in constant email over the last 72 hours as the tanks were rolling into the Crimea. And in fact, this afternoon at 5 p.m., there's going to be a flash session on this stage, which will bring together Oksana from Ukraine, uh, Richard Lusimbo, who is the project lead at SMUG's uh, Sexual Minorities Uganda, who, as you know, uh, is facing the anti-homosexuality bill that was just passed in Uganda. Um, 200 people were, photo, photos were printed in the Red Pepper newspaper on Friday. Richard was on the front cover. He will also be on that panel. And the third person who will be on that panel is Babek, uh, who, uh, Burak, I should say, who's come uh, from Turkey and will talk about the new bill that was just passed to, send, to enable the government to unilaterally censor the internet. I can't believe that that's been up there this whole time and no one said anything. Can we change that, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, as we continue with this opening ceremony, it's my deep pleasure to introduce three internet rock stars, starting with Nena Nakame, who is the co-founder of the Free Software and Open Source Foundation for Africa and the African Regional Coordinator for the World Wide Web Foundation. She's a leader and extremely important voice in global governance, and it's my pleasure to welcome her here all the way from Abidjan in the Ivory Coast. Ooh. Hi, people. Boy, it's a big room. Right, my name is Nenna. I come from Africa, and I work for the World Wide Web Foundation. I was born on a Wednesday around this time on the 5th of March. So it's birthday time for me. Thank you. It's also the birthday of the World Wide Web. The 25th birthday, it's going to be on March 12th. Myself and the web will have a long story. The web has become critical to our ability to achieve a whole lot of basic rights, like getting good education, finding a job, earning a living, holding our government accountable, and participating fully in the decisions that concern us. Increasingly, our democratic rights as citizens now depend on whether and how we use the web. Personally, as a blogger, from Africa, originally Nigerian, having lived in six African countries, having seen about three wars and seven coup d'etat, and now working 95% online for the World Wide Web Foundation, you can quote me about the huge influence of the web. But all of the gains I've mentioned are all based on the web's original design. Free, open, decentralized system, offering privacy and freedoms. Freedom in architecture and freedom that allows us to build upon it and improve it. But just like every 25-year-old person, the web is not fully formed and there are still challenges. And Brett has put some of those here. More than half of the world's population still do not have 
internet access. And this lack of access is not generally because of infrastructure, but because of artificial high prices. And that is one of the things we will need to think about as we are here. The other thing is the centralization of power online. We are looking at another feudal system where the feudal lords are grabbing internet lands. And some governments who are afraid of what the web can do, of the capability the web can give to individuals, ordinary people like me, and to amplify this power in reaction, what these governments are doing is to use the internet as a tool for surveillance, for oppression, and for injustice. And this is one thing I would like us to think about for the time we will spend here. We, we've been doing things as civil society. There's been some remarkable success Brazil, Philippines, Mexico, Nigeria, Tunisia, and recently with the day we fight back. But all of that has been defense. So I came out here dressed up in red to say that it is time for an active, positive agenda. And one of the things that the World Wide Web is doing is launching what we call the Web We Want campaign. The Web We Want campaign is a global campaign of which we have some members here, Access, APC, Mozilla, and others. What do we want to do? We want to create the Web We Want to achieve the world we want. So over the next 12 years, between now and my next birthday, there are going to be year-round celebrations across the world, a year of action for the open web, engaging millions of people in conversations just as we are going to be having them this time around. We want to support local groups, we want to create national bills of rights, and we want to do this in a holistic manner. We want to help update our analog way of being, our analog laws to digital age laws. We want to ensure that web users everywhere become active participants in making the web and demanding change from government and corporations. For me, I think we have gently evolved from being homo sapiens to homo numerus. And it is our collective duty as homo numerus, as citizens of the web, to make sure that our kind survives. Freedom can only be guaranteed by freedom for others. My access is not complete until you have access. And privacy for one is also dependent on privacy for the other. As Nelson Mandela would say, freedom is to live in a way that will ensure that others have freedom. And as he would say, let freedom reign. Thank you for listening. Now, that was just the, the appetizer. Um, it's been my joy to meet one of these great women whose browser, Firefox, I use, whose operating system some of you use, someone who's a champion of openness and great capacities of the web. Please join me to welcome Mitchell Baker, who is from the Mozilla Foundation. Mitchell is the executive chair of Mozilla. Welcome, Mitchell. Thank 
Oh, thanks. You know, it's, ve it's very exciting to be here because listening to what Brett had to say about what happens today, it's clear we're making progress. And that from the first RightsCon here a few years ago until today, we've moved forward a great deal. So there's sessions on exploration. There's also a huge amount of expertise in the room. And there's also execution, doing, teaching, spreading the knowledge that we have, and trying to grow bigger. And so in the few minutes I have here, I'd like to do two things. First is to say thank you. Like that progress and the set of expertise is immense. And you are either deeply engaged in it or more likely the leaders in that. The set of us or the subset of us who have the freedom and flexibility to be here and to represent that set of people around the world who don't have the resources or the freedom or the flexibility. And so first of all, congratulations, thank you. It's been a good couple of years. There's a lot to do going forward. And the second thing that I'd like to suggest is as we go about the sessions and the content and the learning, we keep in the back of our mind the question of how we make more connections between us and the organizations that we represent and the people that we represent. Because the conference is the open internet and rights. And the open internet exists at a massive scale. Billions of people are connected to it. If you want to have impact on the open internet, you need at minimum 100 million people in your product or your technology to really begin to have impact. And today, governments and corporations are all existing at immense scale. So the open internet is about a huge scale, a scale so big most of us can't actually imagine. What is three or four or 500 million people? And yet rights, human rights, economic rights, women's rights, data rights, privacy rights, technology rights, rights exist at a scale of one. You, me, the people who aren't with us, who can't be with us, those who are at risk for saying what they think or trying to better those lives. And so that comparison between rights which exists at an individual human level, and the open internet, or the scale of the network that we live in today, is both an opportunity and a challenge. Our organizations do not yet know how to make use of the scale of the internet to benefit individuals. Companies, corporations are way ahead of us. The scale of the internet comes to benefit some percentage of companies. And so as we go about the content in the work today, I'd like to encourage all of us to think about how do we build connections among us, organizations, ways of working that focus on the rights of the individual but bring that to scale. So for example, the development of democracy was a system for taking an individual right, giving a vote to people, and working at a much larger scale. Now, it may or may not work, it may be flawed, but it's a system that tries to do that. Labor unions are another system that tried to do that. You may think they're important, you may think they're terrible, but they are a system where an individual person is, you know, has, does things and their work is aggregated to represent an individual at scale. Those are examples from 100 years ago. You know, at Mozilla, we try to make examples in the new world. We try to make sure that every student who appears in Bangladesh or Cambodia or India or Indonesia who stands up and says, I want the world that you're talking about, you know, I'm going to do this. You know, we, we try to find ways to support and offer resources and then aggregate that to work at scale. So we're deeply flawed. I offer Mozilla as an example, not because we're perfect, but because <laughs> you know, both our success and our failures are out there in public. And in the technology world, it's not as directly related to a failure of human rights. Meaning we can fail in technology and it affects us, uh, and we're OK at the end of it. So I urge that we also think about how can we connect ourselves? How do we empower others? How do we use the nature of the internet and the web that was described to make a rights community that can grow to immense scale? where each one of you in the room and each one we represent who can't be here is a connection point 
for tens or hundreds or thousands of others who can do whatever it is that they do, not controlled by us, but open and pluggable like the internet, so that as we come deeper into a connected world and a connected society, the set of people who are excited by the individual scale of one, you know, what are your rights and your opportunities, is magnified, and that we can bring the kinds of scale and excitement and focus on rights that we'll otherwise see focused exclusively on technologies and governments. Thank you. And so here to tell us why it's so important is Marice, member of the European Parliament and an active leader in digital rights. Please help me join her. Please help me welcome her. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to thank Brett and Access for continuing to invite me. And after three times, finally managed to make the uh, 11 hour flight. So now that we're all here, let's keep each other awake, fight the jet lags, and make it worth our while. Um, we meet in very historic times. As we speak, Ukrainian activists continue to take to the internet to counter propaganda against them from Russia. But we actually see people from both Russia and the Ukraine using the internet to tell their governments, we don't want a war. And sadly, too often, and maybe increasingly, governments are not representing the interests or the rights of their citizens. I think we need more people, NGOs, businesses, politicians with courage to preserve the open internet, and in this country in particular, to end the destruction of the very values this country was built on, enshrined in the Constitution at the hands of the NSA. And it goes beyond just the United States of America. I fundamentally believe, and I hope that this will be the focus of our discussions here, that the meaning and the legitimacy of democracy are at stake. We're in Silicon Valley, or close to Silicon Valley, and there are companies represented here, even sponsoring this conference, which value exceeds the GDP of some small countries. And with that power should come significant responsibility. And I don't mean just the shareholders, but really towards the public. We've seen how George W. Bush hijacked the democracy promotion agenda. And I'm afraid that similarly, the NSA has ruined internet freedom as a legitimate foreign policy goal. And if some of us have not had a chance to ask Hillary Clinton what she thinks about this, there may be an opportunity when she takes her next steps uh, to run for president. But honestly, look at the responses. Look at this unholy alliance that is forming of countries that are now seeking to re-nationalize the internet. These developments are both worrying but also understandable. We should not just reject these scary and worrying movements, but we must take responsibility and offer better alternatives. The movement to reclaim the open internet is global, and it must be global to be meaningful and to be legitimate. But as we are here, in a country, in a state, and in a county, where the laws of the land have such a massive impact on people all over the world, I think it is important to emphasize that people know this all over the world, and the markets also know this. So I'll end in appealing to all of you, individuals in your own role, in your own capacity, <clears throat> to actually take responsibility for people's freedoms, to reclaim the open internet, and to give democracy meaning, to act against mass surveillance for export controls, against offensive cyber, cyber um, uh, capacity, and for better checks and balances, against the balkanization of the internet, and for net neutrality. In Europe, we still have a fighting chance. There will be a very important vote in two weeks, and I encourage you to make your voices heard afraid that fight has also been lost in this country. The fight against self-censorship and censorship and for copyright reforms, the, end, the list is endless, and I'm sure we have uh, a lot that we can do together here. Thank you for including me, and have a great conference.
I shouldn't. Okay, go ahead. My mic's not on, my mic is on. Um, we're running a little bit late, so I apologize. Um, we'll just have to move from here into the next session. But I do, there is some important things to, to, to raise here, and that is that there are from three extraordinary women um, who are here to three young men who actually are not here. Um, two of those men have um, passed away, and one man who spoke on this stage, Alaa Abdel Fattah, is currently uh, in uh, detention. It's his 101st day. Um, and I wanted to mention first Ilya, um, who is the co-founder um, of Diaspora, um, who was prophetic in his understanding, and I think there should be a photograph of him, um, prophetic in his understanding of the user's control over their own data. And he said a really interesting quote, which I thought was, so it's Ilya, and the quote which is that, Gather epic people around you and make unreasonable demands. And then also the other person who has passed away, who many of you knew personally, and as did I, um, the Access team shared a desk uh, and an office with Aaron Schwartz um, for a year. And um, many of us feel very connected, of course, to this man who was a leader and a, his a historical figure and has become an even more historical figure uh, over time. And we miss him, and he sat here and spoke to us about the importance of an open internet um, in many different forms and many different manners. And he established, I think, revolutionary standards and helped to build revolutionary movements. Speaking of which, yeah. Um, speaking of which, um, Alaa Abdel Fattah, who I just mentioned, was also here. Um, and his, um, there should be a photograph of him. His, um, you can see the Silicon Valley Human Rights Conference, as it was called. Um, and he actually left this stage and headed back to Cairo in the knowledge that he would be detained. Because when he left Cairo, they issued a summons for him. And his wife and his family and his colleagues have sent us a letter. And I've asked Am Gabir, who's behind me, um, to come out and help to actually read it. And I'm sorry, it's, it is a little bit over time, but I think it's important. And um, if you could, um, please, and I will help you as well. Um, when I realized this was not going to be like past arrests, I promised myself to use time here more fruitfully, to read more, exercise more, write more. But then I realized that's not what I want. I always made it a point to puncture the romanticism of prison. Viewing it as an, an opportunity is the worst kind of defeat I can imagine. It would not be my agency that I would exercise more. It would be the authorities. This is Ale's third spell in jail in Egypt, and I'm reading the letter. For those of you that attended RightsCon 2011, you will remember Ale gave a keynote address then before getting on a plane to face the military prosecutor and a set of trumped up charges that kept him in jail for 55 days. His stance, his sacrifice were of major political significance at the time. And today again, Ale is in jail. Today is the 101th day of his incarceration. On November 28, his house was raided. He and his wife were beaten and he was blindfolded and thrown into a truck to prison. The charge, organizing a political protest. He's not here in person to deliver what was going to be a keynote address, but this is how he feels according to one of his letters, February 2014. I remember how easy it was to pack up and fly back, how easy it was back in 2011 to walk to my prison with my own free will on my own terms. I also remember how it felt to lie on the cold floor of the Cairo Security Directorate, barefoot, wearing this thin cotton clothes, my head bleeding, my arms tied behind me, my eyes stinging from the dirty rag they blindfolded me with. I remember how easy it was to pack up and go home to continue my search for a people victorious. I remember how easy it was to walk to prison back in 2011, but I can't remember why we found it so easy to be playful when death surrounded us. I can't remember what it is that made me laugh that day in court. 
That person is just a literary device now. Today, Allah's imprisonment imprisons us. Allah's presence matters not because of his activism, but because of his thinking. As a techie on the forefront of the political internet, Allah spoke much of how technology is more than just a series of tools, but a culture of expression, of mobilization, of organization weaved by the community that is actively destabilizing and reconfiguring the established meaning and perception of the state. By day, he would develop websites around social and political causes. And by night, he would bring crowds who typically discuss things on Twitter to a less virtual setting that bears the merits of the online space that made that conversation possible. As a free and open source software enthusiast, Ale actively inscribed the values of collaboration and openness into his persistent concern to build communities at a time when the state actively disrupted any emerging social movement and in a context where FOSS geeks operate in the margins, he's been actively working on strengthening the links between them and the groups with critical social and political causes. And when back into the virtuality of the internet, Allah has been busy localizing and Arabizing, adding the content that challenges prevalent narratives on Wikipedia and writing code to tweak platforms to respond to the needs of progressive journalists and human rights defenders. His place is freedom. So, yeah, if we could have a round of applause. Um, there, will, um, there will be a, um, a letter which people can sign calling for his release, um, which we will uh, set up today. Um, and um, so from, from that, um, I'm going to finish up now. Um, and I just want to say a couple of housekeeping things. Well, actually, before housekeeping, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Because if it wasn't for our sponsors, this event would not happen. And if we could have a round of applause for them, because they've all put. <laughs> their, their money where the internet is. Um, I want to tell you about some room changes, just quickly, because we had such large numbers of people who were interested in the conference. Um, we will be moving leaders and laggards um, from the fishbowl into this room, which is the next session. So leaders and laggards will be in here. Um, we will also be moving the designing platforms, um, Fireside Chat, with Google, Facebook, and, and Twitter now uh, in here. And then we'll be doing the activist panel, which I mentioned at 5 p.m. in here. There's one other small change, and that is the collateral freedom at 5 p.m. There'll be volunteers to guide you down around, so you'll be fine. But um, that's moving into the platform. So that's collateral freedom. We'll, we'll move downstairs. And with that, the opening ceremony is concluded. Thanks very much for coming, and enjoy the rest of the conference.